Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for this being able to return together to study your word and to meditate upon the deep truths that you have for us. Father God, I pray that you would uh, equip us as we study your word, give us a uh, deeper understanding. I pray that you would guide and direct us. We also ask that you would give us a sense of beauty for, for your word, and that we would leave here transformed, and that we would use these truths to strengthen our, ourselves and also to, to lead others. Father God, we just pray for your blessing upon this time. And also, Father, we just ask forgiveness of our sins. And we're so thankful that we have access to your presence through the blood of Jesus and that you are with us even now um, because of our union with Christ. And so we just never want to take that for granted. And just guide and, and, and bless this time. It's in Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior. We pray all these things. Amen. Let's go ahead and get back into our study in Revelation. It's been, it's been a while. So let me try to share my screen. There's, there's been some new uh, additions to... There's been some new additions to Zoom. So I hope you can see the screen here that I'm sharing with you. And... Uh, mm. It's much, it's much, at least from a, a teacher perspective, it's much easier to, to teach now. So anyway, I hope that you can see the, 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 the screen. Let's just, go, I'm going to go ahead and read, reread Revelation 1, 9 to 20. We're finishing actually verses 16 to 20. So I'll just read this context to kind of prepare us. And then we'll, we'll, we'll go into the notes and then work through the rest of the end of this chapter. So the word of the Lord. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. And in his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, the living one, I died. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this, as for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So, uh, really challenging. I, I think the, it's, it's very surprising and shocking. Let's go ahead and look now at the last part. So just by quick, by qu quick way of review here, we looked at this vision of the voice. So last week, the focus was on the, the vision of, of the voice that was speaking to John. I'm just going to review the descriptions here. Number one, the, the person is, is, is walking in the midst of seven golden lampstands and looking like the son of man. He's clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs on his, his head were white, white like white wool. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet are burnished bronze. His feet, it was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. And um, 
from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and then his face is shining like the sun in full strength. And so we looked at different things that this could be. We talked about how there's this priest. There's this priest imagery here. So let me just highlight these things. So we, we looked at this priest imagery. There's also this king judge imagery. And then there's also this prophetic imagery here. So, um, and this is theologically true and deep, that Jesus is our prophet, priest, and king. Okay? So I do want to say that all of these, th these three concepts are present in this, in this vision, in this um, description. But I did, I did have kind of a, a revelation. I had a revelation. <laughs> so I can say that since we're in revelation. I had a revelation. So, um, uh, I, you know, m my wife and I are watching a show. And so just in prefacing, you know, the show, maybe some people would like it, some people wouldn't. Uh, um, it's, it's not, it's not, anyway, it's, it's pulled. Has anyone hold a Pole dark, pole dark, the show Pole Dark. What's it called? It's a PBS masterpiece show, Pole Dark. Has anyone has anyone heard of that show or no? I guess not. Never heard of it. Okay, so anyway, without going into a lot of details, it's set in the the early 1800s. Okay, in England, and it's 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 tracing the life of a of a upper middle uh, of an upper class wealthy uh from a wealthy family but he's struggling he has a mind um but but there's kind of this class struggle in, in in the in the the show but what's really interesting is that multiple times they have like a courtroom scene where people for various things come before the magistrate and what was it was like so shocking to me so in in the scene the magistrate they have like a wig and the wig is long white hair um it's long white hair. He's in a specific robe. Um, and, and the way the judge, the judge is pronouncing verdicts, it's very like uh, impending. It's, what's the word? It's very like foreboding. Um, it's a very strong imagery. And I was thinking to myself, like, this is kind of the imagery. It's similar. Maybe, maybe the way the English did it back then, they were patterned. They, they were um, um, patterning their their judges after some of these images here with the long white hair, the robe. Um, do, does, does everyone see what, see what I'm saying? For me, it was just like this this revelation that the big picture here, though, what I'm trying to get at is that these all these things are present, but Jesus is really appearing like a judge. So what I'm trying to get at here is that I do think. Um, thinking about this more, that all of these imager, images are true, this, these prophetic, the prophetic imagery, because it's not either or, because Jesus as the Lord of the universe, as God himself, he is priest, prophet, and king. Those are all true, but I do think that there is an emphasis upon uh, judge. Is everyone tracking there with me, um, what I'm saying there? So I, I do think that there is this, and it's, and it's this eschatological God judge. It's this vision of immense power. And so we talked about here that response, the response is quite appropriate. Standing before the presence of the eternal judge I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. What, what are your thoughts? What are your reactions to, to, to this? Do you agree? Do you disagree? Do you think I'm a little bit over emphasizing this one thing? What, what, what are your thoughts before we get into the new, to the new part? Uh, of course, there were elements of fear and yeah. elements of awe. Yeah. Um, and submission, I guess, because of fear and awe. Yeah, no, the, that's really good, Raul, because you have all that. You have the submission part. He falls to the feet. Um, and I think that I, I like what you said, as though dead. And so there is this pure fear, 
but there is also this awe and submission. So I, I like adding those two ideas, Raul, that, that those are those are good complementary. We're, we're further describing this, this comparison here. We're further describing what it means to fall to the ground as dead. Okay, good. If no one else wants to add, that was just something I was thinking about more about as I was contemplating this passage. So let's go ahead and look at the last, the last uh, verses for this chapter. So we're looking now at the second half of verse, um, verse 17, going to verse 20. So again, just I'm, I'm kind of breaking this out as if we were to be, as if we were to be uh, preparing this. So I'm going to separate out fear now. This is the statement. Okay, great. So I just broke them out so we could see everything. So this is how I separate these out so we can really break this apart. And so let's look now at this. So uh, the, the question for, for the first question I want to ask is, so let's look at the second half of verse 17 into verse 18. So we're looking at what's on the screen right now. Um, what do you notice? What is the action what is going on in this in this these verses? What is who is being described? Are there any commands? Are there any promises? Are there are there other kinds of things we can think about here? I guess the first thing I would say is just obviously he fell over dead. So fear not is the first sort of command. Fear not. Right? Okay, so so no, that's good. And but so. He, but he touches him first, you know, he touches him to calm him and then says, fear not, I guess. So the first action isn't even, so the, the first action is, is a, the first action is not speech, right? So you, 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 you mentioned that. So let's, let's highlight this here. The first action is this, this is an action and this is a, um, combining this with the hand, right? This is the object and it's going to the person, right? So the action is his right hand is, is going, is on me. So this is, uh, this is the judge here. This is the judge in this, in, in, in this imagery here. So the first action like though, go ahead. Yeah. It's like an action of comfort. Yeah. So if there's a huge amount of fear, you can say stuff, but the first act is an act of comfort. And yeah, I like that word comfort. So this first act is this gesture of, of comfort. Okay. Before he speaks. And, and so you really see the goodwill, the peace, the, the, the care of 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 the judge here right everyone can see that here and then and then silvio you you bring up this there is so that's the first and then and then he says something right so then he says and there's this command right so i like i liked i liked what what silvio said that there's this command to not fear <laughs> right um go ahead sorry uh, it's just like an assurance, assurance that you're okay, that we, you are okay. You know, it's like fear not. It's a command and also an, a comforting assurance that you should not be fear. Yeah. No, that's good. That's good. The, the, the command is not like a burdensome command. It's a, it's a command of assurance. It's okay. Don't fear, right? So that's really good. So we have this command of um uh, to not to fear. Now, what what are the other? My question now is, what is the relationship between? We're now looking at the relationship between this. Talk to me about these uh, passages here. These these ver these 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 statements here. Number one, what are they? Number two, what is the relationship? 
So we're, we're first asking what we have several statements, right? So I want to ask what they are specifically. How would you define them if you're teaching and someone says like, what, 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 what how do we describe these? And then what is the relationship to this command? How would you describe these statements here? I see one, uh, two, three, but within each one, there's multiple parts. So how would you describe them? I guess it's, it's, it's common when you, when you um, first encounter something that you fear and, and, and do not understand, then it's, it's common for that other person to introduce himself. It's like, here are my credentials. No, that's good. I this like that. Role. I like that role. That's really good. Let's write this down here. So these are, these that's are. That's very good. I, I was, I was trying to figure out like, how do you, how do you describe that? And, and Raul did it perfectly. So these are credentials or, um, uh, description. Like introduction. Yeah. Description or intro of the person does everyone see that it's it's credentials description intro so this is this is who i am right this is who he is so number one so if, 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 we're, if we're seeing that number one with this oh i am i am <laughs> yahweh god no that's good so you have this i am I am now, some people might say, oh, you're, you're reading into it too much. Okay. So anyway, um, uh, what about this other first and last? Have we seen this before? Have we seen this first and last before? Someone talk to me. Where have we seen this first and last in the context? I'm not going to give you the answer. You have to look. Where have we seen this before? Eight verse eight, verse eight. Okay, I'll find omega. Yeah, so verse eight. I'm just going to do the Greek alpha and um, uh, omega, right? What is alpha and omega? What are they in the alpha in the Greek alphabet? I think we reviewed that getting in the end. Yeah, the first and the and the last. I'm checking something right here. Hold on one second. Do not fear. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. This is really good. Okay. So here we go. Here we go. Here we go. I got. This is good here. Um. Oh, come on. Hold on. Let Noel in. Okay. So, if you recall, we identified this here in verse eight. All of the commentators are identifying verse eight as, um, God the father okay and if you recall from our discussion we identified it as actually jesus the son okay now it's a false dichotomy there are two persons but one being i i mean the trinity is three persons one being looking at god the father god the son it would be two persons one being right so so we expect the same type of language, yet distinction, which we have in Revelation. Okay, so Revelation chapter 1 is great for looking how the Trinity uh, interacts and, and is described, okay? But what we see here is, let's say we go with the traditional interpretation that God is the Father, okay? Let's just say we go with that interpretation. I don't agree. I think it's Jesus the Son. But let's say we go with, with that. Verse number 17 emphatically says that Jesus is God equal to the Father. Does everyone see that? I'm going to take a moment, ask a question if you don't understand what I'm saying. So to say Alpha and Omega is to say the first and the last. It's the same thing, just saying it differently. Um. On my on my Bible, there is a thing. It says, "Check Psalm 68." Our God is a God of salvation, and to the God, the Lord belongs deliverances from death. Okay, so 
Uh, Atimari test, that's more focusing upon what is to come, that he is the keys to, to, to death and Haiti. So, so we, will, we will come back to that, okay? Um, that's, a good, that's a good comment, though. We'll come back to that in a minute, okay, Atimari test? Yeah. So let's, let's go back here. So does everyone see, though, how here, this is emphatically, if we hold to the inspiration authority inerrancy of the scriptures that this passage is emphatically declaring that that this person in this vision is in fact god himself everyone sees that correct everyone sees that so this could be a passage where you can you can you can take to your as for apologetic purposes if you have a friend who's a jehovah's witness if you have a friend who is Iglesia de Cristo, if you have a friend who is uh, Mormon, this passage is emphatically declaring that Jesus is in fact God himself, the same equal to the Father, okay? But he's distinct. How do we know that he is the Father, but yet he's distinct? How can we know that in this context itself, because some people say, oh, he's the Father, right? So, the, so there's, there's the, the holiness oneness movement that says that he is the Father, um, there is no free God. It's just different uh, revelations of the same God. How do we know it's not? In this passage, what tells us it's not the Father? Because of the death. Yes. So <laughs> only Jesus, the God man, died. Okay? Everyone try. I, I, I think. I think that line is is more comforting to John because he was one of those who knew that Jesus died. Yeah. So that's that line assures assures him Great. that what he's seeing is Jesus. No, that's who right. he knew died. Amen. And who 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 rose again. Yeah. So 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 th there's there's what you're saying, Raul, is even be is even better. So. We're right now discuss we're discussing uh, we're discussing uh, theological truths that are that are that are important and true, but now Raul is discussing practical. Practical and the emphasis is really upon the practical. The purpose of Jesus saying this is not to say, see, I'm God, you know, I'm God, if I, you know, this is the dogma you have to have. This is the doctrine. I'm not saying that, okay? Um, we are interpreting it theologically saying, so what is the theological truth? But the emphasis, which is where we're getting to, is this idea of this is comforting. Um, this is comforting because... Because you know me. I, you know me and I know you. But it's more than just him knowing, right, Raul? It's more than just him knowing. It's more than just him um, even experiencing death. It's, it's I am the one who died and is alive forevermore. Yes. So it's, it's even more. It's greater than that. It's, it's, it's comforting because there's a lot of judges, right? There's a lot of judges. There's a lot of kings. There's a lot of principalities and powers. In, of, of, in the spiritual realm and what jesus what jesus is de declaring is that i am so so here let's 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 get practical okay so we did some the theology it's important um so i am the lord god i am the lord god and actually so luigi your reference to the i am is actually quite significant because in in greek you don't have to say ego a me. I mean, sorry, but that's the Greek, but you don't have to say that the structure is such that it does emphasize the I am from Exodus three, the Lord, the I am. So, so Luigi's comment is, so the first statement is fear not because I am the Lord God himself. Number one, I am God, right? So don't fear, right? Number two, number two, he is the living one in that he is uh, um, uh, 
eternally self-existent and sustaining. He's, if, if you can control your own life and, and existence, you are all powerful, right? Um, and then, and then he's the one who died and behold, he's alive forevermore. And, and this here is what Rao is really saying. And I really like is that this is really picking up on this idea that he is the one that John knows. He's Jesus of Nazareth, the one who is crucified. So the crucified, risen Christ. Okay? All right? But it's more than that. So he is the uh, good. The description of John when he saw Jesus was not like the same Jesus he saw. Yeah, he's been with for like you know three years. You know because look at the description like uh, the the stars, the uh, the feet. You know, it looks sword, totally different. Yeah. That's why maybe like in a full armor. That's why maybe he didn't recognize him. And mm. you know, <laughs> is this really the uh, when we see Jesus? I wonder is this the kind of Jesus we're gonna see or in his in his. Uh, battle gear or something like that <laughs> until until the man said or oh, that the, that the lord said i am the one yeah. you know who died and live forever more i'm the alpha and omega you know kind of no pastor tim pastor yeah. tim yeah yeah i, I don't want to take out too much time on this but you mentioned about jehovah's witnesses yeah i have a friend i have a friend who's a jehovah's witness and we're sort of going back and forth with respect to Jesus's divinity, right? And I'm just, I'm, I'm, I, when I read that passage, I can hear him what he would say. What, what would he say? What, would he, say? Um, what he would refute, right? Yes. What he's going to say about, uh, what he would say is, I am the first and the last. He's going to say, I am the first refers to being the first yeah. who was resurrected into a new creation. Yeah, that's, how that's, that's what he's going to. He, that's what he's going to say. So it's not the same thing as the Alpha and the Omega. That's what he would say. You know, I don't know if, if there's a good reputation to that that I want to say to him. For you know, do you, how would you refute that? You know. Yeah. So ho just give me one second here. Let me let me just look at one second here. I don't agree with that, but I'm just yeah. saying. I know he would say that. You know. No. Yeah. That's so. That, that, I'm going to give it. I'm just going to give a reputation really quick here. So let me just. Um, let me see this here. I want to get a good passage, though. Um, you can reference so, that to so, the verse. So this is, this, is why, this, this is why you would say that. Th so this would be a passage that, that um, would refute. This would be a passage that would refute. So, so I would say, I would definitely say Alpha and Omega is not the same as first and last. Um uh in a very literal wooden sense but but to miss that connection would be number one i think that you're 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 inappropriately sp splitting hairs so the question is did the author mean for us to make a distinction now he would say uh of course his response would be yes okay but but then my next question would be so how is the lord god he's 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 referred to as the first and last okay I mean, Alpha and Omega, and, and, and he would say that's, that's God the Father, not Jesus, in verse 8. What about the Old Testament? So this is just, these are just several passages. You, you can actually write them down. I'll write them down as I'm reading them. Yeah, so let me read this again. I, 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 I'm sorry. So Isaiah 41, 4. Who has performed and done this, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, the first and with the last. I am he. So God the, God, the Lord God in the Old Testament is the first and the last. Are we to say that, oh, well, he's just the beginning. Of, it's, it's nonsensical to say the first and the last is not a reference to creation, but to eternality. Okay? That's the first passage. The second passage, again, um, so, so Isaiah 41, 4. Then you can go to Isaiah 44, 44, 6. Thus the Lord 
the king of Israel, his redeemer, the Lord of hosts, says, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Jesus says, fear not, I am the first and the last. <laughs> you can't get around that. Jesus is quoting QED. Isaiah, declaring that he is God himself. There's no way to get around that, okay? There's no way to get around that. Um, yeah. yeah, and so that's when you say, oh, Jesus is calling himself the Lord God, but then he's died and alive forevermore. How do we synthesize that? How do we answer it? Ah, the Trinity, <laughs> the divinity of Christ. That's the. That's why we are. That's why we hold in the Trinity, and and and, and that, that's the the reason why you have you have the truth that Jesus calls himself the Lord God, and you have the truth that Jesus, in time and space, died, rose again, and is alive forevermore. So. That's why we have the divinity and the, the, the two natures of Christ. That's why we have the, the doctrine of the Trinity. Convert. <laughs> my last of thoughts. Convert. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, trying to yeah. show them. But. One more passage. One more passage. Isaiah 48, 12. Isaiah 48, 12. Um, again, listen to me, Jacob, O and Israel, whom I called. I am he. I am the first and I am the last. So this is not one random reference to God, the Lord God calling himself the first and the last. And then what, what your friend would probably say is like, oh, that's just, that's a different context. It's not the same. It's like, no, in Isaiah, a common description of the Lord God is he is the first and the last. Okay. And so John, John the evangelist is a Jew. He is, he is a strong Israelite. When Jesus says, I am the first and the last, he's not thinking about uh, created. He's thinking about Old Testament reference to the Lord God being first and last. So, and no doubt you're, you're probably right. They're probably going to, he'll probably have something else to say, but at least I would say that that would be a strong, so let me write, is it? Yeah, I would say, I would say that's, that's very strong. That's very strong. Yeah, I got the three. Thank you. Now, here's one other thing. Here's one other thing. I'm going to give one other passage. I just saw a cross-reference here. Uh, I think you, everyone should go this. Go to Revelation 22, verse 13. Revelation 22, in verse 13. If ever, if ever, if ever, if ever, you can let him respond. You bring this passage, let him respond. The Alpha and Omega is different. Look at Revelation 22, 13. I am, so this is the, Jesus speaking. I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. There's no way. There's no way. You can't sit there and say there's no way. It, yeah. It's impossible. Are you saying that, um, if I understand, you're saying that the Alpha and Omega is different from the, from the, the first and the last, or they're the same? So a Jehovah's they're Witness saying. say they're different. We're saying they're the same that, because they're right. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. Good. Good clarification. Good. Good clear clarification. Because in verse eight, it it will it says there already in, in Revelation one eight. Yeah. Well, in Revelation one eight, Pastor, a lot of commentaries say that that's a reference to God the Father. The Father. Yes. But we we made the argument that it's to me the context clearly describes it as as Jesus the Son. Yeah, because he's the one who's coming, not the Father, right? Exactly, exactly. But as soon as you identify as Jesus the Son, that's an Old Testament citation of what the Lord God the Father says. And so as soon as you acknowledge that 1-8 is a reference to Jesus, you're already calling him the Lord God Almighty. You're already exactly. calling him God himself. So it's just... The only thing is the... Uh... The Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe that Jesus is the Almighty God. Jehovah is the Almighty, and Jesus is only Mighty God. I, That's how they. Yeah. Like small G. Yeah. Small yeah. G God. Yeah, yeah. So that's why. So. But you, you made a really good point on on the last on verse on Revelation twenty two. It's everything is there. Alpha Omega, first, last, beginning, and the end. Everything is covered there. That's that that will. I think, and I think the dot. 
Yeah, and here's the thing. It's the very end of the Bible. It's the very end of the Bible. So I really believe, I, everyone, I really believe that John is bringing together at the end of the entire Bible, he is, he is declaring emphatically, without doubt, Jesus is the Lord God of the Old Testament himself. Um, so yeah. does this mean Finn, that we, get, we, we, we already finished the book of Revelation because you already jumped to the end? No. Are we yeah. done? No, it's a four. It's, it's a four <laughs> I'm, I'm giving you a. I'm giving you a sample. I'm giving you a sample that allows you still to buy the product. <laughs> amen, amen. That's 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 really good. That that that's a good supporting verse for our claim. That's good. It's strong. It's good. Yeah. Great. Okay. No, this is really good. This is why. This is why I, I want to come back to Raul's point. This is why. Um, we, we have that multiple different type of perspectives of reading Revelation theologically, exegetically, um, uh, uh, with an evangelistic, with the gospel in mind, practically with, because this is, this is primarily a practical text. This is, this is not a theological treatise, but this is operating from deep theology, if that makes sense. It's operating from deep theology and deep theology is very practical. I want us to see that here, okay? Um, all right, I'm gonna move along a little bit quick because we're already, the time is, the time is fleeting. So we have this, we have a, uh, a description here. And then we have, uh, this is a state where you could also see uh, also a description in that he is the one that died and is for, alive forever more. And then this is a possession. A possession, I'm not saying that Jesus is possessed. <laughs> I'm not saying that Jesus is possessed. But that this verb here, Jesus has something. Jesus has something. Ownership. What? Ownership. Yes. Ownership. Oh, I like that word, ownership. I might change that word to ownership in the future for my um, students. Ownership. Jesus is in possession. He is in control. He owns and is in control of what? The keys. The keys. <laughs> Pastor Noel, who is in control of your RAV4? Of course, Jesus. Yeah, but the one who has the key, right? <laughs> if you have the key, you are the gatekeeper. You are the one. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right? So it's so Jesus has the keys. Jesus is in sovereign control of death and Hades. Okay. Um, Go ahead. Jesus is the only one who experienced to get to die and see how the dead is the hell is, and he's the only one who were able to tell you what hell is. Yeah. He is certified, totally certified. He's the only one. He is the only one who can tell what death is. Yeah. And to get out of it. Yeah, and so it's, so Ati Marites is bringing up a good point. Uh, we talked about this here. He experienced death. So Jesus has experienced what we go through. He's experienced the death of his friends. He's experienced death himself. And, and he, so he relates to us. He resonates with us. He, he, he empathizes with us, but it's more than that. You know, someone can empathize with you, but if they have no power, who cares, right? He I have has a question. power. Go ahead. But you got out of it. That's what it is. So, so... Nobody so dies the, and live again forever more, but just him. So if he has the keys, you know, to of death and Hades, it's like he has the keys to the gate. Is that in reference to, and upon this church, I, I, upon this rock, I will build my church, and even the gates of Hades will not prevail. I don't know if, if that's a, a, a good reference for that particular. No, so... I think, so here's the thing that, no, that's a great connection because also there's the keys, right? There's keys of kingdom of heaven that he gives to the apostles, to Peter, right? Peter and, and the apostles. So I, I think, I think, Pastor, that 
it's 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 an it's analogous, but there is no direct connection. Meaning to say, because in that context, I've studied it. Pastor made me study it. So in <laughs> in that context, it's the kingdom of heaven that's conquering the kingdom of Satan. Okay, so death is the mm -hmm. more negative context. Here, I think it's more just it's the, it's the it's the power and control over death self, if that makes sense. So 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 we want to be alive and in the presence of God forevermore. So death and Hades is of course negative, uh, but I don't think it's as connected with the kingdom of Satan. Yeah, I thought that so. I, I thought so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's a great. You mentioned it earlier. You mentioned it, he experienced death and overcame it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That is not that having the keys to the death of hate and hate, right? Well, it's well, well, it's more than that because because we can experience something and then even overcome it, but that doesn't necessarily mean we have complete sovereign control over it. What, gotcha. what this is saying here is that Christ has uh, he has uh, sovereign control he lets people in and out <laughs> we're all going we're all going to be in it right he's going to let us out of it one day unless unless we are raptured unless he he's the only one who can bail us out yes he's yes he's <laughs> it's just like it is just like you know if you go to jail uh, let's say he see what is supposed to be. If we go to jail, let's say let's go to uh, hell. If we go to hell, we can. We do not know, but Jesus knows. If he can get it in and get out, and he can bail you out too. And nobody can do that. Yeah. Only God. It's true. That's right. It's true. Good. Now that's a good observation, Ati Maritas. Okay, we're gonna. We are gonna get through this. I am committed to this. We're gonna do this. Okay. So, um, uh, the, the next thing he says is, the next thing he's going to say here is he's going to give a second command. Okay, so I hope everyone can see the second command here. The second command is going to be to write, to write. Okay, so everyone sees this here. Write, therefore... Those things that you have seen, those things that are, and those things that will be. Okay, so I want I want to look here at this word. So it's always translation. So so in Greek, it's um, the the ESV translate have seen. Um, the, the, it's, the Greek is not as strong as that. That's really an interpretation. So in this case, Pastor Noel, um, you know, I'm not as keen on this word have seen. We could just write this as what you see. This is like a comprehensive see. Because he's going to see a lot. He saw a little bit in the past just with this vision that's already started. And then it's moving into the future. So Therefore, write the things that you see. I would actually, I would actually um, say something like that. C, or um, it's like a comprehensive C. Past, I don't, I don't like as much this have seen. It's not present tense though, because typically in Greek, when you use a present tense, it's really vivid, like what's going on, like right in the present, and it's more comprehensive than that because it includes past. And then what's going to happen in the future. So I would translate it right there for the things which you see. And then you have the clarification here. The clarification is, is the present things, present, what are. And then uh, uh, this what's is going to happen. What will happen. So, so I say, Dave, it's not like the past, present, and future. Yeah, because I, so I don't know, maybe what, yeah. what you were saying, what you have seen is previous to the conversation here, he yeah. has seen a lot already. Yeah. So I don't know if that, what's he meant about that. You know? Well, no. So here's the big. So here's the big takeaway. There, there's debate here. Some people that are really looking for like a, a, a pure, like futurist, like things. What they would say is more about 
I'm going to throw this word out. If you're not familiar, just don't worry about the word, but like a dispensational view, they would say, number one, saw, number two, uh, R, and number three, will take place. So then this is the, this is the, this is the outline for the book of Revelation. That's what they'll say. And so then they look at strict chronology. And I would say that it's not, that's not what Jesus is really, that's not really what the Greek is saying. It's, it's right there for the thing that you see, but which things, namely those things that are and will take place. This is more yeah, of a, everything that over and over the lifetime of that, of, of, of John, right? What was that? Like over his lifetime or over, right? During his time of, of seeing, right? But, but that's what I'm trying to say. It's not in the past. It's, it's in this first vision that he's still, this vision is still in the, he's still in the present of this vision. This vision is not past tense. Oh, oh okay. Right. So not, not including it, the past. Ongoing. Is so it, the first vision is. Ongoing. Yeah. So that's why it's, you know. So he was writing this while he was seeing it. He's not writing it as he remembers it as it happened. But he was yeah. writing it is what as it was happening at that moment. That's what, that's how that so it's it's at that moment. Of course, you have to see the vision, then you write. So it's not like, but it's not like yeah. looking back at these visions. It's like right. ongoing. So as as he sees the vision, then he writes. You know, yeah, like that. So you know, or you could say that once he sees all the visions, is he, he like? It all down. Is he like taking a dictation and also the visual as he, he writes? So, it, you know, it's just right away. I mean, right at, from the start, from the time that he, he, he speak, like he said from the uh, 17, when I saw him, that's from the beginning that he has to write until the very, very end of the revelation. Is that what it means, right? Yeah. You're saying? Yeah, because remember, remember, it's like, an, so this is the first reference. What you see, what you write, what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches. So what I'm trying to get at here is that this is actually. So he's always what, writing in the present. What I'm trying to say is it's a restatement. It's a restatement from verse 11. Okay. But it's all happening. It's Jesus. So he says it twice. He's like, what you're going to see, what you're seeing, write it down and send it to the book. So it's like right then, right, 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 right then and there. Yeah. So whether. He watches, he sees all these visions and writes it down, or he sees a vision, he writes it, then he sees another vision. I don't think it's that clear, but it's clear that however it is, it's in a short amount of time and he's writing as he's seeing. Yeah. 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 That's true. And the other reason too is that because when you look, as we look through the book of Revelation, it's going to actually be cyclical. The first ending of the book is actually in chapter 11, not in chapter 22. Chapter, we'll, we'll, we'll look at this as we read through the book. The, the end of time happens, first occurs in chapter 11. It's crazy. So that's why I'm saying you can't take it as a strict chronological pattern, which people would use this as an argument. Past, present, future. Because there is a cyclical nature of of these visions the visions will come back and retell what's happening in a slightly different perspective okay um and you'll see that i don't want to go through all that you'll see it as that's why i don't i, I want us to see it as we work through the text okay so what, what you're saying uh tim is at, at the time that we read that in that chapter it doesn't necessarily mean that that occurred at that time. He well, may, he well, may flash back to something. Well, the vision occurred, but when those events that the vision point to occur is, is the question. Okay. Yeah. So you're looking at two layers. You're looking at the vision itself. Mm -hmm. then, then what does that vision, what does that vision signify? What's it pointing to? Yeah. Well, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna share my cards. What I'm trying to get us to see here is that is that these visions, the design of prophecy, 
the design of these visions is that there is a practical application for us in our present. The design of prophecy points both to the near and the far future, okay? So that's the design of prophecy. You see it in the Old Testament prophetic text. You, you see it even in Jesus's pro prophetic text in his earthly ministry, and you see it again in Revelation. So they're both pointing towards our time and events in our time, but they're also pointing to the distant end of time events, okay? Now, maybe we are in the distant end time events, okay? We don't know that. But what I'm trying to say is that what, the purpose of saying, identifying that is so that we can't remove ourselves and say, oh, there's nothing for us to worry about. At the same time, we shouldn't say, oh, this is, this is, uh, this is it. You know, what I'm trying to get at is that we should always have the same perspective. As Jesus said, um, the wise servant who is watching and waiting expectantly for the return of his Lord. That's the perspective and that's the design that Revelation wants us to have. Okay, so we're just going to end this right now. Um, so then Jesus just gives the interpretation. The, the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. Okay, so the seven golden lampstands are the seven churches. I'm sorry, the seven stars are the, are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Okay. Now, uh, there's debate here. Some people will say that this is, um, uh, this is literal angels. And so there, each church has an angel that watches over it. So the seven stars are the seven churches, are the seven angels of the seven churches. So it's literal angels watching over the seven churches. And then others will say, no, this is the, this is the pastors, the pastors of the seven churches. So the, so the seven churches are, the seven churches are, right? Um, they're listed. These are listed in Revelation 1, 4, and also in Revelation 1, 11, I believe. Yeah, verses 1, 11. So it's Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Okay, so then. Okay, I understand now. Yeah, so then the seven. So then, the seven stars are the angels, and so people say no, they're literal angels, and then and then they say, well, no, in keeping with, because angel can also be angel is just a transliteration. So, um, in in Greek, it's angelos. So, so literally, if, if I'm going to transliterate it, it's A, G, G, E, uh, L, O, S. Okay. And actually this sounding is an N, is an N, G. The, 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 to double, double, double gammas in Greek actually have the na, na sound, right? So angelos or angel. That's where you get angel. So what I'm trying to say is that so what does angel mean though angel literally means messenger so an angelos is a messenger okay is everyone tracking with me so yeah so let me just let me just i'm gonna just give me one second here so so what you could what you could if you're interpreting not in the tradition of Christianity, but in like literally, literally, you would say the seven stars are the seven messengers of the seven churches. So that's why, um, you could say it's literal angels, beings, divine beings watching over the churches, or you could say it's the messengers that are, that are, um, you know, over the churches. So that's why we, we'd say, um, now I have to think about this more, but my, my, I would lean strongly right now to the pastors because it has to have practical benefit. The pastors have to be warned. 
right? Does everyone see that? There's going to be warning and blessing in chapter two and three. That's your assignment. Read chapter two and three, right? So it, it makes little benefit if you're, if, if it's an angel, the angel might appear to the church. It might not, you know what I'm saying? Like it makes more sense that the seven stars are the pastors of the seven churches. Yeah. So, so this is, this is, I'm going to read you the four different options of interpretation commonly held to this view of angel. Number one, it refers to angels or heavenly guardians of the churches. So that's one, that's one, and that's a, that's a, that's a big view, view, view. And that, that has been my view in the past. And perhaps I'll come back and say, that's the case, you know, um, uh, others will say it refers to the churches themselves. Uh, I think that's kind of a hard read. Angel refers to the spirit of the church. I think that's kind of a hard read. That's kind of really, uh, that's, that's, that's rough. That's difficult. Number three is it refers to human messengers to the churches, probably pastors or prophets to the church. I like the messengers of church. Yeah. I, I, yeah. That's where I lean right now, but it's not black and white. And if you held, to, I would say those are the two. And then the fourth is it refers to spirit. So I would say the two best possibilities would be literal angels, heavenly guardian beings, or, or passengers, prophets that are bringing the message to the church or presiding over teaching the church, something along that. You know, that, that, that's, that's my perspective right now. Yeah. First time I heard it. Yeah, no doubt. Um, but I hope that you can see that it's not black and white because literally if we're to translate it without, without transliteration, it's the seven stars are the seven messengers of the seven churches, literally. Yeah. So it's not, it's not black and white. Okay. Is that okay. any, we're getting, we're going late here. Any comments or questions? Um, uh, I'll just review some things and then anyone want to share. I want to first say that the primary purpose of this text is practical, as Raul said. So this should give us comfort. This text should give us comfort in who Jesus is. In who Jesus is. And so what I want to say to us tonight, during these terrible times, during these times of uncertainty in the Philippines, in the U.S., around the world, fear not. Fear not. The judge, the Lord God of the universe, he's on his throne, and he is the one who we are in union with. We are in union with Christ. He is the first Amen. and last. He is the living one. He is the one that has died and overcome death. He's alive forevermore. Um, and he has complete control over death, both now, temporally, now, physical death, and eschatological, eternal death. He has those keys. And so uh, if we are in Christ, fear not. <laughs> fear not. And then the second thing I want to say is that John was told to write what is going to be written to the seven churches. And um, we talked about before that the seven churches are representative for all of the churches. So the last thing I want to say is that we are present um, the messengers of the seven churches, the, the stars and the seven churches, uh, that can be ICF and that can be us. So all of us should be listening to what has been written. Blessed are the ones who read aloud the words of the prophecy and blessed are those who hear and obey. <laughs> okay, so we're bringing it together. So uh, we should not say, oh, it's for that church back in the first, no. Uh, we are one of we are part of the of of of, of the churches. There is a lampstand in Pottstown, and the star is <laughs> Pastor Noel. Pastor Noel. Um, and so, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I got goosebumps, man. I'm not a star. I know. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is that that, that, that makes it that makes the. Uh, that makes the responsibility of the pastor even heavier and challenging. Yeah. You know. Amen. To be to be to be likened to an angel is is oh my God. No, it's 
you, it's true. So what I want to say is fear not, but listen, listen and obey. And we need to be reading aloud the words of this prophecy. So that there is, there is a method to my madness in rereading the passage. And right now my family is reading through Revelation. And so maybe I want to encourage us that your devotions or your family devotions, just read Revelation. No doubt things will not make sense, but some things will. Let us saturate ourselves with Revelation. The re because remember, it's not the revelation of the last things. It's not the revelation of, of terrible events. It is fundamentally the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so if you're reading it with any other object other than a focus on Jesus Christ, you are misreading the book of Revelation. So with that, I'm going to end our discussion. And uh, I just want to encourage us to continue our study to focus, to focus here. And uh, I will turn it over to Pastor Noel.